my name is Guillem, and I will present you the work that uh, we did on uh, convolutional neural networks for mesh-based parcellation of the cerebral cortex. And I will start by introducing the task of cortex parcellation. So there are different areas in the cortex, and these areas are involved with our cognitive processes, like visual processing or language processing or social interactions. And um, uh, one challenge in understanding how the cortex is organized is to be able to create a map of these areas in the cortex, or in other words, to be able to parcelate the cortex into meaningful areas. And then what we propose to do in, in our work is to parcelate the cortex by operating on in vivo mesh reconstructions of even individual surfaces um, constructed, constructed from structural MRIs, which are called cortical meshes. Then a cortical mesh is a common coordinate system that we can use to represent data coming from different neuroimaging modalities. We can represent the data from different features and we can represent data from different individuals in the same mesh structure. This means that we can co-register data from two different subjects into the same, sub into the same structure, which later facilitates the processing and comparison uh, between different individuals. And, and therefore, uh, these kind of uh, uh, cortical meshes are commonly used to study uh, structural and functional patterns of healthy brains, as well as studying abnormalities on psychiatric or uh, neurological conditions. And what we propose to do here is to parcelate the cortex by operating directly with these cortical meshes. So there is some previous work on this topic. Um, for example, we have the paper by Glasser et al, who uh, used an MLP classifier that processes uh, node by node of the mesh uh, in order to produce a label for each, uh, for each node and parcelate the mesh. And then there is also the work by Jacobsen et al, who uh, used uh, functional connectivity templates at each vertex and then uh, compares these uh, functional connectivities against uh, functional connectivity templates computed from the training set. And uh, based on this comparison, a uh, label is assigned to, to each mesh. However, uh, these two approaches do not uh, fully exploit the underlying mesh structure of the data because they are operating in a node-by-node -node, uh, basis. They are processing each node independently. So uh, we want to use some kind of architecture that can uh, process end-to-end -end from a mesh input up to a mesh segmentation. So we have seen how uh, deep learning approaches uh, excel at many different tasks. And one of these tasks where deep learning is uh, very good is at image segmentation, which is uh, very similar. Actually, it is uh, an analogous task to the task of mesh parcellation. But, but rather than operating on 2D images, we want to operate on, uh, on meshes. So the reason why uh, convolutional networks work very well on uh, images is that because they, they exploit the underlying 2D structure of the input data. So uh, for example, they instead of having a parameter for each input value, they use these uh, uh, weight uh, matrices that are shared across the input. Uh, this results in parameter sharing, so we have a lot less parameters and, and the model is, uh, is uh, well, is more robust to, to overfitting, which is very important in uh, medical imaging tasks because we usually have a very low amount of data. So the problem is that we cannot directly apply one of these 2D convolutional layers into our data because our data is represented in a, in a different structure, in a different domain. So we have resorted to using graph convolutional networks in order to be able to use convolutional networks with our mesh structure data. So in the recent years, there has been a lot of work on how can we generalize convolutions into different domains. And um, one, of the, uh, recent, uh, one of the recent approaches is graph convolutional neural networks or chepnets which uh, try to approximate uh, the, the graph convolution on the spectral domain by using uh, Chef-Chef polynomials of a different order. And then we have also used a different method, 
which computes self-attention coefficients between each pair of nodes and uses this self-attention coefficient as, a, as their convolutional weight. I will not go into much detail on this, but uh, there is much uh, more detail in the paper. And so, but of course, it will, if we want to see how much do we improve by actually exploiting the underlying structure of the data, we have to compare to some baselines that do not fully exploit this structure. So we have decided to use some, some uh, basic baselines. So the first one is what we refer to as node MLP, which is a multilayer perceptron that uh, is trained on uh, nodes features. So it processes the nodes independently without looking at other nodes from the mesh. Then we have node average, which is a very, very basic approach that uh, basically uh, predicts the most frequent label for a node computed on the training set. It's not uh, looking at the features or anything. And then finally, we have uh, like an improved version of the MLP, of the node MLP, which is what we call mesh MLP, where instead of processing each node independently, um, we concatenate all nodes and we uh, process them through an MLP that produces the segmentation for for the full mesh at once. And, and this is a slide that more or less summarizes the differences between these models. So for example, we have uh, this node average that it's not using features and it's not merging information from uh, local neighborhoods around the node. Uh, we have the node MLP, which is only based on features, but it's not capable of exploiting the structure. And then we have the mesh MLP, which is based on features, but uh, it has access to the global information of the mesh. So if, if we think in terms of images, uh, node MLP would be like classifying or segmenting an image by classifying the pixels. And mesh MLP would be like uh, flattening the image into a 1D vector and, and uh, running it through, a, through an MLP. But of course, if we know that our data has some kind of structure, um, like to the images half, uh, we can go further and rather than using uh, fully connected layers, we can use convolutional layers. And this is what we do with, the, with our um, graph-based approaches where uh, uh, we exploit the underlying structure in form of a convolution. And also, if we stack several of these layers and we increase the receptive field of the, of the network, we are also uh, able to to um, look at a larger uh, portion of, of, of the mesh in order to, to produce an output for, for one node. Then, in order to evaluate all these models, we have focused on the task of broadcast region parcellation. Then, this broadcast area is a cortical area which is related to language processing, and that can be further subdivided into two different areas, which we call uh, 44 and 45. Well, they are called this way. And um, so it's, it is an interesting region because it doesn't have uh, an exact position, an exact shape within the cortex, so that it motivates uh, the need to have some kind of automatic approach to automatically locate and segment this, this area. So, and then more specifically, we have used a data set from the Human Connectome Project in which we have cortical meshes for this broadcast area uh, from uh, 100 different subjects. And then each cortical mesh has around 1,200 nodes. And we have nine features per node. Uh, six of them are structural features like cortical thickness and, and so on. And three of them are uh, functional features, which are fMRI correlation between three different uh, regions. And then uh, the goal is to classify each node of one of these cortical meshes into two, three possible labels, which are um, area 44, area 45, or uh, not belonging to any of these areas. And we also study uh, how can we uh, increment the features by adding uh, the position of a node within the mesh as, a, as an extra feature. And then, because uh, the data set is quite small and we only have around, uh, well, we only have uh, 100 subjects, we have decided to perform uh, cross validation in order to have more, more robust results. So we split our 100 subjects and, uh, into 10 different folds, and we, well, we train with eight of them, use one for validation and, and one for testing. And we 
train all our models using uh, an Adam optimizer, and we either optimize for weighted cross entropy, or we optimize for dice loss, which is a loss that is more specific to, to segmentation. And now I will um, show you the results that we get. So, um, so these are the different baselines that we have evaluated under previous uh, work by Jacobsen. And we can see how by going from classifying each node alone independently to uh, uh, classifying the whole mesh together, so merging information from all the nodes, um, the, the method is already much better. But uh, as I said before, this is using fully connected layers. So if instead of using fully connected layers, we use these graph convolutional layers to uh, uh, as, a, as the layers to, to in, in the forward past, then we can see how we, again, uh, outperform the, the baselines by exploiting this structure. And we can also see how we outperform the previous work by um, Jacobsen. And we can further improve the scores a little bit if we introduce the position of a node within the mesh as a, an extra feature. And so besides these uh, quantitative results, we can also inspect the actual segmentation produced by, by the different baselines and by the graph convolutional based models. So for example, uh, so this is the ground truth for two subjects and the parcellation for this broadcast area. And for example, we can see why no, no MLP is so bad. I mean, we can see that the low score uh, is very bad because um, the segmentation is actually pretty bad, whereas the other models are a bit better. But for example, if we focus on, uh, take a look at this yellow area here, we can see how the other baselines tend to overestimate the, this area, whereas our uh, graph convolutional based models do not suffer from this issue and they uh, provide a more accurate segmentation. So, well, yeah, so um, I skipped a lot of details. You can ask me later or, well, or catch me here and, and discuss it. But um, I want to finish by uh, summarizing the main highlights of our work, which is that um, we have applied um, graph convolutional neural networks in order to process cortical meshes directly on these uh, mesh structures. We have ev evaluated uh, graph convolutional based models against simpler baselines on the task of broadcast area segmentation. And we have empirically seen both quantita quantitatively and qualitatively how uh, graph CNNs outperform the other baselines and the previous work. And yeah, thank you all. Um, thank you for a very nice talk. I think there is a question right over there. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is that um, you said you have access to global information from the GCNs, uh, right? Um, so yeah. that was depending. That would depend on the receptive field, yeah. and you also mentioned that it's stacking, you know, different yeah. GCNs. So what was the number of layers you had stacked? Okay. Yeah. So we have stacked up to eight different layers, which uh, which a receptive field of five hops, five uh, nodes in each layer. Okay, um, all right. So the second part is you also used attention-based networks. And uh, if I looked at the, uh, based on the results that you showed, uh, those seem to perform slightly worse than your yeah. normal GCNs. Could you just comment on yeah. that? Yeah, so well, basically, Thanks. this attention-based, what it's doing is that it's computing an attention coefficient between two nodes in order to, to create a convolutional parameter between, between them. And so that this introduces extra parameters because um, we have to uh, process the pair of nodes in order to create the, this uh, attention coefficient. And so the slightly worse result could possibly come from uh, overfitting because we are introducing more parameters. And actually, all these models, like the baselines and, and also the GCNs, um, overfit quite a lot to the data. So maybe the extra number of parameters is the reason why um, it may perform slightly worse. Um, there is a question at the front. Yeah, thank you for the uh, nice presentation. Um, 
I have a question about the uh, uh, so, so uh, as a baseline. Uh, so, so in the computer vision field, if they sh uh, care about shape uh, recognition, so they just render the shape in a three D uh, volume and then have convolutions which can take off the sparsity uh, uh, there. Have you tried something similar, and how would it perform? Oh, no, we haven't tried um, so something like this. We were trying to compare. Um, so the, uh, the previous approaches that were processing the nodes independently to an approach that tries to just apply convolutions into the main structure of the data. But we haven't applied uh, shape-based uh, models. In, uh, no, not shape-based. Just render the whole thing into a volumetric representation and ah, then okay. just a standard volumetric uh, uh, segmentation. And, and the uh, only thing what you can do then is uh, you can use sparse uh, uh, kernels, which use the sparsity of the data set, and then you can work on extremely large uh, okay, data. Okay, okay. And uh, this works, at least in the computer vision field, much, much better than anything which works on the meshes directly. So it would be interesting to see how it Yeah, yeah, actually, works yeah, it would be very interesting. It would be a great addition to, to this. Yeah. Yep. Good. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, very interesting work. Just a quick question on the mesh. Uh, have you considered, I think, as far as I understand, you used the same mesh uh, given, but have you experimented with adding additional edges to kind of capture more long-range uh, interactions? Mm, so that's actually a good question. It could, maybe that could be a way to introduce some kind of dilation, um, like to perform dilated convolutions. Um, so yeah, it could, be, it could be interesting, but, but um, so I see it as a way to increase the receptive field maybe. Uh, we haven't tried, but yeah, uh, it, you could possibly, yeah, you could do that. Any other question? Um, maybe I can ask one question. Can you talk about the ground truth parcellations? Oh, yeah. How was that obtained? So, um, well, actually the parcellations were uh, come from the Human Connectome Project and they have been obtained uh, manually annotating the, um, the actual uh, parcellations of, of the regions. Um. If there are no more questions, we can maybe thank the speaker again. <laughs>